Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, tonight we're gonna we're just we're just kind of hanging out. Um, I'm here uh, making some maps for my campaign. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I am I'm Shars. I'm the GM for our Sunday, not Sunday. Ooh, our Tuesday um, shows, and uh, yeah. Uh, I run Safra. I'm also a player in our Sunday campaigns. Um, so I get a little bit of both, which is phenomenal. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, today we're just like chilling and I'm gonna I'm gonna do some, some map making um, and answer some questions. So if you have questions, pop those into the chat. If you're annoyed by my squeaky chair, so am I. It is the worst. I need some WD-40 stat. Um, and, uh, yeah, don't judge me for my poor map making skills because, you know, it's not the best. It's not the worst, but it's not the best. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on this. We're gonna give a couple minutes for some, some people to start wandering in, um, and then you know, then I'm gonna get started. Got some nice ambiance in the background. excited we've got some like really cool uh questions coming in from um the people have sent uh before so oh geez what happened there oh um whatever um so yeah i'll i'll get started on some of those questions in just a little bit <clears throat> Um, yeah, I'm only going to be on for half an hour today. Um, just, you know, just, just kind of chilling here for a little bit. Um, yeah, so, uh, so this is um, Paradise Rolls. If you are unfamiliar with our channel, uh, we are an actual play D&D podcast um, where we play Dungeons & Dragons live. Um, and we are super nerdy, and we just like to have fun. So we like to just like hang out and laugh at each other, mostly, and at ourselves. Um, so yeah, this is this is what we're doing. Um, all right, I'm gonna start with um, with a question that came in. Um, okay, so the question is, uh, what's been the most challenging part of GMing, and the most rewarding? Um, that's a really tough one, actually. Um, I, I think what I would have to say is that um, the most challenging part, um, honestly, sometimes is like getting the motivation to do it. I know that sounds like really negative and really terrible, and, and what I mean by that is that like, you know, there's a, it's a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into this, uh, into preparing. Um, into preparing the sessions so uh so it's it's a it's a little difficult um you know i probably spend maybe three-ish hours a week preparing for the session um and then i'll do anywhere from like half an hour to an hour and a half extra of like future planning um trying to come up with like cool stuff for the characters for the players um inventing new npcs uh, and building parts of the story that, frankly, nobody's gonna explore ever at all, ever, because that's just the nature of D&D. So, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's like, 
All right, gotta pull up the energy to get it. Um, so I think that's been the most challenging. The most rewarding though is actually doing it. Like every single day that I'm feeling like I just kind of like I'm a little sluggish and I'm like, um, you know, meh, um, I, I get there, I, I like I push myself through it and, and I'm, I just have so much fun. Otherwise I love being with all the players and everything. Um, that's that's rewarding on its own, especially uh, as as a writer, especially like seeing the players put the pieces together of like the mystery or the story and start to be like, oh, that is referencing this thing back then that happened to us. That's really fun. Um, okay, which is your favorite story event that you came up with? Ooh, good question, sense foil. Um, let's see. What is the favorite story or event that I came up with? Hmm. Um, I really do like the ball. Um, if you haven't seen the Summer Solstice Ball episode that's on YouTube, I, I put a lot of like time and energy into developing that out. Um, and that was that was just so much fun to to put together. It was it was like I don't know. It was really fun to like visualize it and uh, you know have the assassin come in at the end. I, I don't feel like I'm giving anything away because, you know, you probably already saw it. <laughs> um, all right, let's hit another question. Uh, let's see. Oh, my favorite character to voice? That is a really good question, too. Um, hey, Zeraldo, what's up? Um, okay, what's my favorite character to voice? Uh, ones that don't take a ton of, like, vocal effort. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, but for real, like, I, uh, I really liked, um, the old man that I did, who was, like, a little bit, a little bit wackadoodle, um, he, uh, was the one who, who had a shop, um, he went by Chad, it was a whole thing, um, I think that was one of my favorite, uh, favorite ones to, to play, um, Wackadoodle old men are fun. They are. Yeah, Arterian um, has that kind of voice. I was doing a character last night who was just like wrecking my throat. I just, I, I can't remember. Uh, can't remember who it was. Um, oh, the, it, definitely the, uh, <laughs> the shopkeeper. Yeah, the Bronx guy, yeah. The Bronx guy shopkeeper wrecking my throat. Um, you'd think that I'd be like, uh, you know, I'd warm up beforehand or something. I, I usually sing in the car, like, before. It doesn't count as a warm up, apparently. Um, yeah, I drink lots of tea after the session, but it has to be decaf because otherwise I'll be up all night. Um, I already consume a, what should be an illegal amount of caffeine at, at this point, so, um, you know, I, I kind of just need to, like, chill out on that part but yeah um <laughs> tea is great uh i would say especially with honey but i don't eat honey so um <laughs> yeah i do the caffeine before i go to the sessions um and i, I don't do them after <laughs> i don't do the caffeine after i usually just crash um i cannot find the i guess this is what i want um oh that's massive um yeah Caffeine absolutely does help. Um, my favorite character that I've played. Ooh, man, y'all are coming up with like the good questions. Non NPC. Yeah, I'm 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 like super partial to um to some of my NPCs. So uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna uh, definitely not go with one of the NPCs uh, that I love. Um, character that I've played. Um, so my very first D&D character will always be near and dear to my heart. That is why I brought him back as an NPC. Um, but the, uh, let's see. I would have to say that... You know, I really like, I really like Xyler from The Proving Grounds. I think he's probably one of my favorites. Um, he's got kind of the most uh, personality so far. Um, I mean, obviously, we'll see what happens with, uh, with the new campaign because, you know, that, uh, 
that character is is also a lot of fun. I just haven't ha like spent a whole lot of time with that character yet, so you know it's kind of um, that's kind of up in the air. Um, yeah, exactly. Changes with the new character for sure. I think that I think each character I create gets a little bit more interesting um, and and fun to play. So uh, that's that's what I look forward to in new campaigns. Honestly, I've got so many characters built out that like eventually I just have to start putting them as NPCs. Like um, I have the uh, uh, from our our home game, uh, which is Dragons of Ice Spire Peak. I was running that one before uh, that as my first. Um, campaign to DM, and that one, uh, I created a, a um, cleric wizard named Zalari that, uh, that was, like, super emo from the Feywild, and, like, amazing. I loved him. Um, because nobody had, any, like, there was barely any healing uh, to be had among these, among, among the players. So, um, so I created him to kind of, like, provide some, some little backup little bit a bit of backup for healing and uh, in case the players needed him and eventually they didn't and that was great i could retire him because it was really hard to play a regular npc um <laughs> um but yeah speaking of discord because it's on the the thing now uh on the in the chat um a lot of our maps are available on discord um connected to the different campaigns so you know you can check those out um or not. Um, okay, let's see. Let's do some more questions. I've got some that people have sent me. I'll hit those between chat questions unless something comes up. Ooh, yes. I prefer the chat questions. Do you go a little overboard and make backstories for characters that 100% do not actually need it? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Hey, what's up? Welcome, welcome. Um, yeah, okay, so like, here's the thing about backstories with characters. Um, and like, my other DM friends will like roll their eyes so hard at me um when i mention this but like i because i'm a writer i like actually write the, the the entire backstory um in like novel format right so it's usually like a couple chapters worth of the backstory um and then like i'll start with like really broad overview and then give like super detailed events that led up to it and then i'll like go back and fill in things as we go so like Zyler Hawthorne from the Proving Grounds, um, I've got like a t maybe 50 page backstory on him um, that is actually like not just this is what he did in his life, but it like has scene by scene the things that led up to him ending up in Meritas at the beginning of, of the Proving Grounds campaign, which we were not filming at the time. So I have so much backstory uh, for all of my characters, and it's absurd. <laughs> uh, yeah, yep. Now that's what I call music 87. Yeah, he, he does listen to that. Um, I mean, and it gets down to, like, like, all about his family, too. It's, it's absolutely absurd. Like, well, I, I don't want to, like, give too much away, because we're actually, like, getting in the Proving Grounds. We've gotten to his hometown, um, where a bunch of, like, mysteries are going to be um, unveiled. So I'm going to, like, not go too deep into that. But, yes, the, like, my backstory is ridiculous. And so that is actually, like, a good segue to, like, some shameless self-promotion um, for for Paradise Rolls. Uh, we have started a Patreon. We don't have anything on it yet. We don't have our membership tiers yet. Um, but all of this extra writing that I do for the campaigns... Uh, is going to be available on there. And some of it will be available on Discord just, just for funsies, but a lot of it is going to go on to our Patreon once that is set up. Okay. Um, how do you have the patience to put up with these idiots? I don't know. That's my dog behind me, FYI. Um, it's not a ghost moving curtains. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, no, really, but, like, the patience, it's just kind of funny, like, honestly, you know, seeing what people do and what they want to do, because that's the thing about D&D, &D, right? Like, you do what you want to do. Mm. Haunted curtains. So, you know, it's very well known that I have a ghost in my house. We call her Ghostina. 
Um, she may or may not like that, but uh, I'm trying to make it a hashtag. Uh, not really like super successful there, <laughs> but uh, you know, Ghostina likes to throw things because uh, she's kind of a jerk. Let's see, how do you come up with creatures or beasts to use in a campaign? Ooh, that's a really fun one. Okay, so like my imagination is stupid. And by that, I mean it just goes wild. I have, before I even started Safra, I like sketched out on a post-it note this monster that I wanted to create. I, I was watching some kind of like Discovery Plus channel show that was like hunting, you know, paranormal monsters in the forest or something like that. And like, no, 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 no. That was not what I was watching. I was watching a movie that took place in like... Germany or something and there were these people and they had like cut through the forest as a shortcut because they really needed to get it back um which is like the dumbest thing ever and like there's a whole bunch of um crazy stuff that happened in the forest anyway so I sketched out this creature and I, I even showed it to one of our players uh in Safra way before the campaign started and I was like look look at this look at this uh this this creature that I want to make uh isn't it creepy so that's one way um, the, the Dungeon Master Guide, uh, and, and, um, the Monster Manual, um, you know, there, there are several source books, uh, from Wizards of the Coast that, uh, that give you, like, all of the stat blocks for monsters and everything, so, um, that's, that's something I'll do. I also sometimes go to D&D Beyond and, like, just browse, because, like, you can, you can do, like, homebrew stuff and then save it. So sometimes I'll just browse, like, pages and pages of people's homebrew, um, monsters and just kind of see what's up, see what, what's, what turns up, what's there, what sounds cool. If there's something specific that I'm looking for that I know is not a standard monster that doesn't exist, then I'll go to, um, then I'll, I'll go to the homebrew monsters page and find something similar that has like some similar stats and abilities that I like. Um, and then I'll use that and I'll usually end up modifying that monster in some way. I'll usually, you know, increase the HP or the, um, the AC, um, change up some of the, like if they have spells, I'll change up some of the spells to make it a little bit more unique. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the janitor, in Safra was a really awesome spellcaster who had like a ton of really cool spells and abilities and he used one ability to summon a demon and that was it and uh oh really disappointing <laughs> great for the players the players did a great job but uh you know all right um another question who's been a character you hated killing and why is it bulg <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed that so much. Um, no, but but in all seriousness, uh, that's the only character I've killed. So I'm going to say uh, that's my favorite one character that I've killed off. Uh, and also the one that I've hated killing off the most. Uh, he enjoys the murder. You know what? He really does. He enjoys the murder a little bit too much, maybe. Um, so for those of you who don't know... Um, that's a reference to our home game, uh, which was Dragons of Ice Fire Peak, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and one of our players did not want to play his character anymore. And so he and I, uh, you know, hatched a scheme to kill the player, or the character off. Kill the player. Ha! Could you imagine? Um, that would be terrible. So we killed the character. Uh, everyone was sad. People cried. And then he made a new character that was uh, pretty cool. And then we stopped playing that campaign because we switched to this one. So, you know, uh, I do, like, have dreams and not in, like, the, like, oh, I just woke up. Oh, I had a dream kind of way. But, like, I wish that we could get back to that campaign. That was a lot of fun. It's very structured. I like structured campaigns. Homebrew is great because there's a lot of flexibility. Um, it's also, it also puts a lot of, like, the amount of prep time that goes into it is, like, three times as much as, like, a book. Or at least this book. It was a starter guide, so, you know, that, that's, that's a little different. Um, yes, yeah, so Zeraldo is the player, uh, that, that, that happened to. 
Sorry, I didn't know if you were like trying to keep your identity a secret. Too late! You can't be a secret. Um, yeah, so he got dogpiled and poisoned to death um, by zombies. Yeah, so like, no, ghouls. Sorry, ghouls. A bunch of ghouls jumped on him. Uh, and honestly, literally everyone just kind of stared. Um, like, like nobody actually like jumped. Like they took their turn doing nothing. Uh, which I thought was a little bit shitty. But, you know, I mean, great. Uh, in all fairness, some of them were truly too far away to do anything. But um, it really also happened so fast. He went barreling in. He was a... Uh, Bulg was a... Um, uh, barbarian, uh, Goliath Barbarian, and, uh, yeah, he just charged into a room, and it was full of, full of these ghouls. Nobody else went in with him, so nobody could have gotten to him. It was just, it was epic. So epic. Um, definitely enjoyed killing him off. Um, let's see. Ha, <laughs> all is fair in love and D&D. Let's see. I've got more questions here. If you guys don't have more questions, it's fine. I've got, I've got like ten more that someone sent me because like we apparently are just a mystery. Ah, just kidding. Um, do you like my little my little map? Isn't it cute? This is this is what I'm starting with so far. I actually just need to count these squares real quick and then I'll answer another um, another question. One, two. One. And I guess it's not really. I guess you can't really do anything else about that now. Okay, who is the coolest druid, and why is it Elwyn? Um, yeah, I mean, you you're actually gonna have to to fight some people. I've had three druids playing in my campaigns, um, and then my new character is a druid. Uh, and I'm gonna say that one is the best. Ha. Just kidding. No, Elwyn is so much fun. Um, so much fun to play with. I just, you know, expect the unexpected with that one. I I always secretly hope that, uh, I mean, yeah, she's a hot mess, but, but we love that she's a hot mess. I secretly hope that, like, every session she'll do some kind of spell and just be like, oh, it just fucked everything up. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so much fun and it's like so true to her character like in her backstory if only you knew i mean you do because you are her but like the rest of you if only you knew um <laughs> yeah hot messes are great i love them i surround myself with them um let's see okay uh what is your ideal D, &D player Ooh, ooh, i love this one okay so i actually have like a thing that i like cannot stand uh, with with um, some things, so I'm gonna do the opposite of what my ideal D&D player is and tell you what D&D player I do not want at my table. Um, and I think most uh, GMs and DMs will agree with me on this. But uh, there are a few types of players we don't want to see at our tables. We don't want like we don't want a table full of what people call murder hobos. Um, so basically people who just, like, want to go around killing all of the NPCs and everything. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I really like players who will, like, go along with the story and, and, like, work with the rest of the people on their team. That's really important to me as a, as a DM because it makes it really hard when, you know, um, when there's too much infighting. I think a little bit of infighting is great, um, and it, it, like, builds some relationships. Um, and then there's also, like, a point where, like, it's like, all right, y'all have to come together for for something. Y'all have to, like, have a common goal um, and, like, really, really come together and do it. Um, oh, I, there's also, like, I, I don't like... I like having players who are fluid with rules. If you've, excuse me, if you've watched uh, Safra at all, you'll know that I, I stick with some rules and other rules are just kind of like not important to me like i don't i don't sit there with the dmg or the the phb and be like these are the rules is written um i i like to favor logic in my world a little bit more so 
people who are constantly like, actually, you can't do that. Actually, like, especially if it's something for flavor, this happened at the beginning of the Proving Grounds where, um, again, before we were streaming, uh, I was I was just doing something for flavor. Um, I was like, I wanted to put out some fires uh, for flavor um, with, uh, with a cantrip. And one of the players who's, who's not in the campaign anymore was like, yeah, that's just a cantrip. You can't do that. And it's like, well, I'm very aware of what the cantrip says. I'm very aware of what the spell says. Uh, the spell gives this parameter that I stated when I said I wanted to do the thing. Um, and that's my dog drinking water because she's the worst right now. Um, and then, yeah. Uh, it was like, it was perfectly within like rules as written. And also it was really just for flavor. Um, and he just did not get that and was like you can't do that anyway um do you ever have those moments after a session where you go oh damn i wish i thought of doing oh yeah absolutely all the time and then i just rework those and try to fit them in next time <laughs> um and like specifically there's also like moments in the sessions where i'm like oh man i wish i would have thought of that dang i can't even take credit for that now <laughs> um but no yeah i i i usually just work them in the next time or find a way to work it in. It's actually it actually makes it like really easy to do that <laughs> because uh, it like makes my future planning easier. Cause I'm like, awesome, just had a great uh, great idea for this thing. Um, how do you manage a campaign when the characters don't go in the direction you expect? Um, so every DM has kind of like a different perspective on this. Uh, in my experience. Um, there are two main approaches that I can just kind of think of off the top of my head. Uh, one of which is, um, to railroad the players into going where you want them to go. Hey, Mofongo! Welcome! We're chatting, hanging out. Um, so when, uh, so you could, you know, as a GM, you could, like, be a jerk and railroad the players into going someplace. Uh, I have done that before. I don't like doing that often because I think one of the greatest things about this is the freedom of choice. And while I like to think that I'm God, um, I, it really is not all about like what I want the players to do. Um, so the other thing is, if they go in a direction you don't expect, you just gotta have to make it up like on the spot, like <laughs> just you know improv, think on your toes. Uh, and it's, it's kind of fun, and uh, it's really hard when you first start uh, to improv and to, like, figure it out um, and to be okay with that uncertainty. That's, that's kind of hard uh, when first starting out. But uh, you get used to it, and you get a little bit more confident, especially, like, the more you know your world. Like, with... Uh, and this is kind of the big difference that I found with running a homebrew campaign versus running pre-written campaigns. In the pre-written campaigns, you only have so much information. And then you're kind of just like, am I like making it up? Like, what if I make something up but it contradicts something later in the book? Because I just, I don't, for some of them, I, I just won't sit and read the whole book at once and like know all of it. Um, but when it's, when it's homebrew, you got two options. One, it either becomes canon in your world or you already know for the most part what your world is like what how things work where things are so uh so when when something happens and characters go off in a direction that you're not fully prepared for you have an idea usually so like locations are a big one uh which brings us to another really good question here that i've got um so uh the what what's some advice for somebody who wants to get into DMing? Um, so you do what I did, which is I watched a lot of actual play podcasts, uh, different ones. Um, I specifically observed how the DMs or GMs in those uh, those shows did it. I participated as a player and observed how, how, uh, <laughs> I'm just going on a tangent, you have to be creative. Yeah, it's, it's kind of rough, um, and you're, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to do that. Um, yeah, so I, I observed my own DMs, um, let's see, 
uh, for, for becoming a... Oh, yeah. So uh, get yourself a starter kit. Uh, I like the starter kits. Uh, they're really well laid out for beginner DM and for beginner players. And then, like, DM in a safe space, right? Like, I try to make all of my tables safe spaces, whether I'm a player or, uh, or a GM. And, uh, you know, if, if you are interested in GMing, then get a couple of players who you know really well, who, you know, are fairly familiar with the game, and get them to kind of play with you with the understanding that you're learning. And um, if they've been a DM before, then that's, uh, you know, really good. Because then, you know, if you have a question, they can be like, oh, um, I actually, I, I, don't, I don't know how I'm, what kind of role am I supposed to do for this? And then they'll tell you with, with kindness, hopefully. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> Critical role or dimension 20. Um, both? Both. Both. Um, I adore Abria Iyengar. Oh my god. Like, anytime she's on screen, yes, I'm there for it. Um... <laughs> I have to pick. <laughs> um, ugh, I like them for different reasons. Um, I'm going to have to go with Dimension 20. Honestly, yeah. Sophie's Choice up in here. <laughs> I know, right? Um, yeah, I'm going to go with Dimension 20. I just, I, you know, Brennan is great. Um, they're just so fun. You know, I think the thing I like about them is that they have a very similar vibe that at least the Safra campaign crew has. Um, you know, and just kind of like laughing and making fools of ourselves. Which is what I like about it, about the game in general. <laughs> um, okay, okay, let's see. Oh, what is a campaign you have, you would like to play in but haven't? Mm, yes, okay. Uh, a campaign that I haven't played in but I would like Jeez, oh my gosh, there's so many. Okay, so here's a problem with, like, <laughs> with D&D. Love it. Um, and there's never enough time to do all of the things, right? So, like, the Proving Grounds we've been doing since, like, I don't know, August of 2020? Like, it's been going on for a really long time. And, like, I have a job. I have a full-time job. I have a family. I have, like, you know, responsibilities in my life. Um... That I, so I can't just dedicate every single day of my life to d d no matter how much I want to. However, um, there are some specific uh, campaigns that I really, really, really want to play in. Um, I just have to like pull up the list of them because uh, there are just so many. So many. Um, so... Curse of Strahd is definitely one. Yeah, yes, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Curse of Strahd. Yo, like that one is so cool. And I just, I love the Gothic era and everything. Like I'm, I'm so into it. I really want to play in that one. Um, Candlekeep Mysteries is kind of like, I'm, I'm interested. I don't know too much about it, but I'm, I'm pretty, pretty into that. I really want to play in the wild beyond the witch light. Oh my gosh, so much. I'm all about the Feywild. I'm, I'm totally like, I'm totally a Feywild girl. I just need it in my life. Um, and then there's another one. Not that one. Mm. Uh, it's the, it's the one, what is it called? It's the one that like, they did in conjunction with Magic the Gathering, where you're at a, a Magic Academy. What is it called? Hmm. Zeraldo knows if he's still on. I know he does. Oh, maybe it's just a source book. Is it just a source book? Strix Strixhaven. Strix Strixhaven. Yeah. But, hmm. No, that's not just a source book, right? I don't know. Anyway, I'm really into that one. I really just I really want to read that. And if it's like an actual adventure, I want to go to that one. Like, for sure -sies. 
Um, yeah, okay. Um, has DMD leaked no aspects of your life? Oh my god. You have no idea. So, um, I do this thing, which is like really unproductive. Um, but like, I'll start like making jokes. So like the other day, um, like my husband dropped something and I was like, huh, oh, you failed a dexterity saving throw. And he was like, what? Um, so like... <laughs> I do stupid stuff like that all the time. Um, if, like, you know, if, like, my husband is trying to convince me to do something, um, then I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to need you to roll a persuasion check at disadvantage because I really don't want to do that thing. So, yeah, you know the face that he made at me. Absolutely. Um, so that's kind, of, <laughs> that's kind of the stupid stuff I do. Um, I also talk about it way too much. And it's weird. It's like a weird kind of evolution where I was kind of like, I don't know if I feel really weird talking about it because like it's been stigmatized so much throughout my childhood. Like it was not cool to play D&D, but like honestly, I don't, know, I don't give a shit anymore. Um, and so like I bring it up at work all the time. I'm like, oh yeah, we've got a D&D group and it's the best thing ever. And um, I, people probably actually just don't even care. But uh, anyway, yeah. Oh, yes, into minis. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, I've got a ton of minis already, and uh, most of them need to be painted. I have one teeny tiny paint set uh, that is like the undead paint set. It's not appropriate for all the minis, and so like anytime I do a different painting project and I have some paints left over, I'll like use that one paint to paint a bunch. So I don't have them here. They're, they're in my car right now, but um, I've got this like giant box of minis, and... Uh, and like six of them have different articles of clothing that are like royal purple because I use that on uh, to paint something for my mom's birthday. So like <laughs> it was, it's it's a little absurd, um, but I yeah I just I I, I love me some minis. Um, you don't even want to see my list of heroes on Hero Forge because. Uh, anytime I create a character, which is all the time, I just make a new mini of it because it helps me, like, visualize, um, the character. And so, like, yeah, it's actually, actually quite ridiculous. Like, I saw a meme the other day, um, and it was, like, it said, like, Hero Forge, um to the players and it says something like, are you ever gonna order all of these minis you keep ordering? And the players are responding with, nope. <laughs> so yeah, all about the minis. Ooh, when you create a campaign, what is the first, first thing you like to do? All right, so here's, <laughs> this is uh, this is what I did for Safra. Before I, created the story, I created the setting, I created the world. And so I put this like massive piece of like, it was a it was a spare piece of a cabinet, like the cabinet end piece, but like the really cheap thin piece, it was from a, um, from a cabinet project we did at my mother-in-law's house a couple years ago. And uh, so I, I put that out on my ottoman and my couch, it took up like most of the space, and then I rolled out a big sheet of paper because I've got this giant roll of paper that I use for maps. Um, it's amazing. And uh, I have no idea where this roll came from, but we like somehow acquired it in like 2011, and I still have it, and it's weird. Um, but anyway, so I rolled out this map, and I basically just took like a bunch of pinto beans, dried pinto beans, not like cooked uncooked raw dried pinto beans and I just like scattered them around on there and then I started like drawing the outline of the shapes that they clumped and made um and that became my world map and so uh that's how I I created so if you like look at the map of of um Safra which I think is actually on it might actually be on discord I'm not sure um I'm gonna check real quick. 
Uh, hum, bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. Oh, that's character info. Ooh. Maps. Nope. <laughs> I didn't put it. Um, yeah, Pinto Bean Method. Okay, I'm, I'm going to throw this map um, on into the map section. I think I was waiting until, like, my players actually got a map, but they kind of actually got the map, so we'll just go from there. Anyway, uh, you'll notice, like, the really really uh interesting and unique shapes so that's that's the we, i had a lot of islands i have like 11 continents because i also rolled a d20 to tell me how many continents there should be um it's a pretty extensive world um and so i always start with all the world building and then i zoom into the section of the world that i i want and after i've like thought through like the the um Pangea life, yes. <laughs> it all moves together. Well, so, actually, okay, let me tell you a funny story about this. Um, there is a region of of my world called Ilaria where uh, it, is, it is a giant continent that, like, goes the entire length, and it's, like, a solid piece of land. And it's, uh, and I call it, like, the spine of the world. And um, the reason that exists is because the paper went too far and I didn't notice it. And the when the beans landed there, it like started to fall between the the couch and the little table and it almost just spilled everywhere, but I caught it. So uh, so now there's just like, you know, that, that piece there. Um, so that was a pretty fun um, thing about it. So yeah, anyway, after I figure out like how magic works and you know, sort of the governments of the areas that I want to focus on, then I start thinking about, right, well, what's going on? What's the problem here? What what kinds of strifes are there uh, in this part of the world? And then that's where I start creating the story. Okay. Um, have I gotten through all these questions? I've been jumping around a little bit. Oh, my I ideal DM. Excellent. That's a really great question. Um, so I prefer um, a DM or a GM who is really uh, engaging in the story and in the characters. And so embodying the characters, doing the voices, like doing the movements, really getting into it, feeling the character, and, uh, and doing enough description to really take me to that place. Like I really, I wanna be there because I don't know if you've looked outside lately, but this place sucks. So I want to be there where it also sucks, but it's fantasy. Um, <laughs> and I actually have power to do something. Um, no, but like in all seriousness, like I, I want to be like taken to that place. I want it to be like I'm reading a book, but I'm actually like part of the book, you know? Um, so that's, that's my ideal DM. Um... <laughs> favorite campaign that I've played. Oh, I mean, I've only played a, a few um, that are actually like quite memorable. So I'm gonna have to say Proving Grounds so far. That has been my favorite. It's been the longest lasting that I've played in. Um, yeah. All right, well, I, th I think that wraps up those questions. Look, I got so much done on my map. Um, okay, cool. What other questions do you all have? And if you don't have any, then I'm going to go make dinner. Yeah, yeah, the Proving Grounds is Essie's homebrew campaign. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, thanks for hanging out with me. Um, I'm going to go make some dinner and uh, got to keep working on this map. But, uh, oh, there's one more question. Okay, I'll answer this question and then I'm going to skedaddle because, like, I'm so, so hungry. Um, <laughs> favorite character who was a Serafina. Oh, my God. Okay, Serafina. Yay. She was amazing um, and, like, a stumbling rogue. If, for those of you who, like, don't know, again, Reference to the to the home campaign, um, the home game, uh, Dragons of Ice Fire Peak. Serafina was a halfling rogue um, who was obsessed with Bolg, you know, the, the 
play the character that I killed. And, uh, yeah, she was so much fun. So feisty. Loved all the feistiness. <laughs> Okie doke. I'm gonna go make dinner. Yeah, the one I murdered. I murdered that one. Um, but yeah, so, uh, a couple more, like, announcements real quick. Um, <laughs> yes, taking out beloved players, is, or beloved characters is one of the cool parts of being a DM. Um, yeah, murder is, is definitely bad. Um, okay, so, announcements. Uh, Sunday is the launch of the Rakis, 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 uh, I don't know how to say it, I'm not the DM, um, Conquest. So uh, we'll get some guidance on how to say that on Sunday. So you should join for that, because that's going to be fun, where we all learn how to say the name of this campaign. Um, and uh, I'm in it. I'm playing um, a character. I'm not going to give too much else away. And then hopefully Sunday evening we might have Proving Grounds. I honestly don't know. Um, and then uh, we'll be back on Tuesday for Safra. So... Thanks for hanging out with me. We'll see y'all later.